Heads up, you're listening to Fresh Cut, hosted by renowned golf superintendent and sought-after course consultant, Tim Barrier. Every week, Tim and his team pull back the curtain with guests to dissect the details and stories of how the PGA and LPGA prepare courses for tournaments. Don't worry, we won't leave you in the rough or sunk in the drink. So tune in, hit that subscribe button, and relax. And now, here's Tim and Matt Palmquist on the Tee Box with this week's guest. Hey, welcome to another episode of Fresh Cut. I am your co-host, Matt Palmquist, along with Tim Barrier. And today we have the great pleasure of having the course manager from Royal St. George's. That's right, I said it. Royal St. George's, Mr. Paul Larson. Thank you so much for joining us today. I know you're extremely busy. Um, I know there's a time difference, but for you to take the time out of your day today and, and join the, the Fresh Cut crew, it's a, it's, a, it's a pleasure. So welcome, Mr. Paul Larson. Thank you. Thanks for asking me. Uh, always got time for you guys. So I look forward to it. Paul, I appreciate you coming in. Um, I have to tell you, I'm a, a bit of a fan. I, I saw your interview on the Golf Channel. Uh, you were standing out in the golf course, and somebody from the Golf Channel was interviewing you, and I was just amazed at uh, your fresh personality. You got an interesting new take on, um, I, I think, the, the golf course superintendent or the greenkeeper um, you're, you're an excitable guy. You, uh, you're really into what you're doing. Um, you've got a great personality and sometimes we don't get uh, great personalities, um, you know, in the golf industry, you know, uh, golf course superintendents or greenkeepers are, uh, generally, um, very detail oriented, uh, almost OCD, uh, at times. And they take their jobs very, very seriously. And I know you take your job very seriously as well. I'm not saying that at all, but I was just, uh, really, really taken by, uh, your fresh attitude and just your your whole kind of rock star <laughs> that you had uh, there during the open and and I have to tell you um, one of the things that I noticed about your golf course um, is you have set a a standard a different standard for conditioning um, but you still you still hang on to that that uh, that UK uh, British Isle style um, you know that that kind of that link style where it's it's still a very natural environment and a natural arena, but the conditioning of the turf grasses, um, your bunkers. Um, in fact, the interview that I saw, you were using that torch to burn down the stacked bunker face walls of your bunkers. And I just thought that was the most intriguing thing. It, what an incredible way to keep that growth out because you, you know, when you let those sod stack walls go, they get weeds in them, they get growth. It starts to separate and split and you have to come in and, and rebuild. And out here, believe it or not, there's some, uh, some courses that are actually using artificial turf to get away from that. And so I thought that was such an intriguing way uh, for you to do that. And I think maybe we can get into some of that as we, as we go along, but, uh, I, I just thought that was an amazing thing, but I, I wanted to ask you kind of, first off, who taught you, who was your mentor? Uh, who taught you to be the, the steward of the land that you've become and how did you get going in this business? Uh, well, that's a very good question. And, uh, <laughs> I'd like to say I've had a, a mentor as such. I don't, I haven't had one really. Uh, I, I'm into the Jim Arthur uh, principles of green keeping, which is sort of keep and lean, uh, not too much war fertilizer. And uh, he, he was kind of from a, a different generation back then. And uh, I kind of like the principles of that. Right. Um, so when I come back to the course here, I've got this idea of how I wanted the golf course to look. And it's just gathering information from all sorts of people, from farmers. I, I'll tell you what, I have been lucky. There was a few members and one who died a few years ago, but he taught me a lot. Uh, and farmers, we all can criticise in the past, but they know so much. And they've helped me and they knew this golf course. And they'd ask, why don't you try this, do this? But I think the thing for me was I had a, a vision or an image in my head of how I wanted the golf course to look. But, and I've always said my description has always been, I want it to look like 
there's a golf course in the middle of the dune land there you've stumbled off the sea and there you are and blimey yeah. there's a golf course yeah. and i kind of like the idea that you're not always sure where the hole should go uh there's a green somewhere there's a tea so it all looks so natural so if right mentors, the one thing i have done if we have sort of mentors now is i've got a club you could say we set up a links club uh, a few years back now with four other fellow head greenkeepers uh reese and craig richard and we're always bouncing ideas off each other and we create this club where all the links courses meet up and we discuss ideas and the amount of people that will phone me up for a bit of advice on oh you've done some burning you burnt the bunker faces or i've sprayed a graminicide or something like that and then i hear that some guys have been doing that as well and all the guys on the irish links course i always hmm. think they've been ahead of the game as well so i've got very friendly with them and uh we just sort of share ideas so we're all mentoring each other you could say if that's uh a bit of an answer yeah it, it's you know you're exchanging ideas and and you know this is this is all about learning and i i you know, I've got a lot of really good friends that are still superintendents and, and I'm doing a consulting company now and I'm, I'm helping a number of uh, the golf course superintendents in this area. Cause I, you know, I used to be that 25 or 26 year old guy that needed help. And I, I had a couple of guys that I went to back in the day and now I've kind of turned into the old grizzled guy that's made all the mistakes. And, you know, I tend to fall down a lot, but when I fall down, I fall down forward and I pick up ground. Uh, and so everybody's failed. I mean, you, you, you yeah. there are those that have killed grass and those that will kill grass. And so I'm, I'm trying to help some of these younger guys avoid some of those mistakes. And, and a lot of it is uh, the personalities and the detail of individuals that are difficult to, to kind of handle. I think uh, here in the States, the, the biggest, part of our jobs is probably 80% is managing the human beings, managing everything that's not golf and not turf. Unfortunately, it's gotten that way. So I'm, a, I'm notorious for killing grass when I played. So. <laughs> we're, we're not talking about those big beaver pilt divot, divots you take out of the ground, uh, Matt, but yeah, thank you very much for that. Um, and so I, I think, it, it, correct me if I'm wrong, I, I know a lot of the guys in the UK use a lot more sand than we do here in the States. And there's a number of reasons for that. Maybe we can go into that just a little bit. We're, we're going in the too deep into the agronomy, but I'm going to guess that, um, you know, very low nitrogen, uh, very natural, lots of sand, a lot of porosity, firm surfaces. Am I, am I correct? Yeah. Um, so when I took over in 11, uh, we, we had quite high organic matter levels up to nine, 10%. Uh, so we did go, we had bad grasses on the green, in my opinion. They weren't true to the Lynx course that we wanted. So the first things first was to try and get a bit more sand in. Mm. It's You know, it, it sounds easy. You think, I'm going to put 200 tonne of sand on the greens. But to actually do it, it's oh. the hardest thing for green keeping to me. It's not rocket science. It's doing the basics right. That's it's right. actually doing the work. Now, it's actually quite hard to go out on the course and get 200 ton of sand down. Now I'll put down now 10, 11 ton every time I do it. Yeah. Um, but you've got to dress it in. It's got to be a bit quiet. You want to do it before it rains. There's a competition coming the next day. So it's, it actually can be quite hard just to do that job. So you've got to find ways to do it. I'm lucky. I always say I've been blessed with some great green uh, staff who have bought into what I wanted to do because it's, uh, believe it, it's quite physical work what we do here. We're not sitting on machines cutting grass. More often than not, we're hand dressing, top dressing by hand with shovels and seeds. Sure. And they will come back in the evenings and we'll dress when there's no one around early in the morning, brush it in before even the first golf is here. So it's been doing all that sort of work to get where we've got to get to. But you're right, it is once I get my organic matter levels to the levels I want to get them, I don't have to do so much. We can gently put the sand in, but sure. it has been up to 200 ton. I eased off um, last year, obviously before the open, because I've got the levels that I wanted. Um, there is a theory now that you can put too much down and we're getting uh, climate change and the heat and all the rest of it. And, uh, and everyone knows I went through that drought of 2018, which was a killer for me. Sure. Uh, so we've undone all the good work, like 
the course was looking amazing in 2017. So to see how it was for this open, pure relief, I think, but a joy in yeah. there to see it all come together. It's a bit like a film. I like it's like I would describe it as a you a you grant rom com film. Interesting. It all gets going, everything's <laughs> nice, hunky dory, it's all good. And then the ex boyfriend turns up, it all goes wrong. And then at the end you meet the girl again, it all goes right. And it was kind of like I was hoping we get the happy ending. So uh not it's ended, but it, that was the end of that chapter. So uh, yeah. uh, you you got a happy ending. I I was just uh, really really amazed and uh, with the conditioning, um, the sharpness of your machines. I I can see it all, and I I you know I look at it differently than say Matt. Matt's Matt's yeah. in the marketing field, but he does play a little bit of golf. But somebody who's grown grass as as long as I have, and and a lot of the superintendents that watch that open, I guarantee you they they noticed they noticed, and and for me, for. If I was in your shoes, that would make me so proud. And the other thing I want to say is that's so nice of you to or, to recognize the orchestra, which is your staff, and you're the conductor, and that orchestra well, is playing that beautiful music. And and so that is so nice of you to say. Well, I, it's funny. Normally, if it wasn't for the open, I like to go out and give it the tease and set the markers up and all the rest of it in the morning. And I do conceive myself as a conductor. I like to see everyone in front of me doing what they've got to do and then I'll be the last one checking it yeah and uh, as it goes we kind of did do that it was just me and uh, I had uh, R&A Alistair Beggs walk with me every morning and that's what we were sort of looking at but right. the guys I was lucky because my guys are great when you say the quality of car and everything is so sharp I've been very blessed with two great mechanics as well mm. All that grinding, you know when you're putting all that sand down oh. it comes back in and the units are all out and the old mechanics that I've had in the past have been like, oh no, another bond blade and all the rest of it. Yeah. But they keep doing it. And do you know what? One of them just says, Gary just says, we've got to do it. This is what we do. Uh, and we get on with it and we do it and the guys do it. And it really was, I was blessed in this open really because yeah. all the support staff that I had, the blooming, uh, it took me a long time and quite hard work to find who I thought were the right people. Uh, but they gelled for us. Sometimes you can have a them and us where the home sort of team are like not quite as friendly, maybe with the support staff, you can get a fraction. Um, you know, it does happen, I believe. Um, but for us, we all got on really well. I've got to throw in my lad into the equation. Uh, obviously, I'm a single dad with my lad of 11. Oh. He just ran around playing football for a week. He had no idea there was a golf tournament on. And every, I think everyone just joined in playing football with him. So it, it's a, that was a great thing to to get us all to gel and you oh. know, a bit of food in the evenings together. There was a few mishaps, you know, the weather was a bit bad on the Monday or Tuesday, and some guys were intense. It didn't go so well, and I was a little bit upset over that. But it's how you bounce back from it, and you know, it was the biggest tournament for us ever. And we're not going to let little things, or there might be big things to certain people, but we're going to overcome it. And you know what? I couldn't be the the praise or what people were saying couldn't be better for me personally, for the team. For I, I can't believe how many people have said how much they enjoyed the Open. It's quite incredible, really. Well, it, it did. It set a new. It set a new paradigm. I, it really that conditioning was head and shoulders above any of the conditioning that I'd seen for any of the previous opens. And and that's not to take away from the other course managers and greenkeepers uh, over there. I, I think that. But you set a new bar, and and you should be commended in your staff. And and so the rom com came out great. Your gaffer and your cinematographer and all the other team players, boy, they made a great a great movie. And so you should be very proud. And I want to kind of roll into the next uh, next. It's a little bit bit off topic it's kind of interesting i married to uh, a lady that is first generation here in the states from from the uk uh her grandfather was from chelsea and was a huge chelsea football fan now this was back you know when world war ii was going on and so chelsea wasn't quite the the wealthy area that it is today and uh, leslie's grandmother is actually from east london where jack the ripper did most of his best work um, and so my parents were also married in London and lived there for four years. My mom was in the CIA and my dad was an embassy guard at the U.S. Embassy. Um, and so it's a very interesting kind of a, 
uh, relationship uh, that you know I I have with the UK, and I've been there a number of times, and and uh, I've not been in that area. But my dad's played Wentworth and a couple other courses when when he lived there. Um, but I want to ask you: Are are you from the London area, or where are you from originally? Yeah, I'm born in London, and yeah. uh, at this point to hear you say Chelsea, but um, yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> I presume uh, from the East End, they're all proper West Ham supporters, and we're doing well this year, so. Uh, yeah, it, it must be a good year. So, um, yeah, I was born there, but my dad's. But you are from uh, then. Sorry. No, my uh, my dad was uh, born in the Seychelles. Oh, okay. Uh, so he and his grandparents or his parents were from Norway, and my mum's from Dublin, from Ireland. So I've got a mixture. Interesting. So I'm the yeah. only one born in England out of my family before my son. Uh, so interesting. A mixture of everything. Um, so, but London's been my home, but I've moved, I've lived everywhere. My dad then was in the army. So I've been all sorts of places. My and dad I, was in the Marine Corps. Oh, we, right. We've got a lot in common. So, yeah, I met a lot of my dad. We lived in Germany for four years as a kid. So it was quite wow. a lot of Americans there. Yeah. And, uh, it was good fun, but I've done a lot of traveling before I was a green keeper. I, I did loads of backpacking around the world, Europe, um, Australia, New Zealand, Wow. And a bit around America. I traveled back, back around America for a little bit as well, which is good fun. So, well, you told me you went to yeah. Vegas. Well, I went to Vegas two years ago, and uh, <laughs> yeah, I've never been to Vegas. And uh, when I woke up one morning, I thought it was, yeah, it was a hangover in uh, <laughs> Vegas. I was expected to see the lion, or the, and I was just like relieved. I still had my phone and my money. So, uh, <laughs> It's, That's it's funny. another place, isn't it? And I'll tell you a little story about Vegas. Um, quite a few years ago, someone messaged me on Facebook, but they messaged me by mistake. It was men, it was from this lady, Cara, who was uh, married to a Paul Larson. But she sent, I don't uh -oh. know how, but the message came to me. So I replied, oh, I don't think I'm the Paul Larson you're after. <laughs> uh, and we ended up starting chatting together. And it turns out, he, I think he's a sort of lawyer or something. Um, but he lives in Vegas. So I went to the golf show in San Diego two years ago. Yeah. Uh, so we arranged to meet up. So I met him in Vegas and uh, Paul Larson met Paul Larson. <laughs> I was going to say he's a dude as well. So uh, there must be some connection there somewhere. That's amazing. That is amazing. That's a yeah. funny, funny story. Yeah, oh. it's, uh, it was good fun. Yeah. It's kind of a small world. Well, you know, the, the golf yeah. show, the GIS, the International Golf Show is in San Diego again. Uh, yeah. So, you know, of course, we're going to get to meet. And I'm actually teaching a seminar, uh, How to Survive and Thrive at Your Club. And it's from 30 years, 35 years of being in the private and, and resort club business and how to survive all the politics and everything else. And so I, I really look forward to, to meeting you and maybe pop oh, your head yeah. in for a bit. So, you, Yeah, when you come into San Diego, let me know. I'll take you to dinner. Yeah, uh, we'll take him to dinner. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we'll go out. Sounds yeah, great. For sure. So yeah. um, I want to bounce back. You, you mentioned weather a little bit, and you know, you hear about this Scotland and, uh, you know, the east and west coast of Scotland getting such harsh weather in, in Ireland. Um, and you're there on the North Sea, but you're more of the southern section of the North Sea. But uh, you can get your your own bad weather there in uh you know, I know that presents a lot of a lot of challenges for managing turf grass and keeping your staff happy and you know fighting the elements and all those things. But uh, how would you how would you say your weather differs from say you know up on the east coast of Scotland, um, you know where all the golf courses are? Yeah. So for me, uh, I mean, it's a bit dry in the east coast of Scotland, I think. But for me down here, um, until this year, it never rains. It's always blooming hot and dry. Hmm. Um, always praying for rain there's always people going on oh, oh he's obsessed with the weather we sounds like have. me sounds just like uh, me yeah I can't help it and uh and this year do you know what everyone's like it's been a rubbish summer but i haven't used our reservoir of water too much my irrigation guy is like happy he's not having to run around hand watering so it's been quite refreshing but generally we're really dry down here and like quite hot and we it, it kind of gets a bit of a european climate at times so I go up to Scotland or Ireland, it's always green, and uh, I get quite envious that they don't have to sort of worry too much about the drought and the heat so much. But saying that this year, I think they've had the heat for some weird reason, 
and uh, we've had a bit of the rain, but it's so, I quite like having a bit of rain, like. Yes. Uh, even though the weird thing is, the winters, the last two or three winters, it doesn't stop raining. So we've almost been flooded in the winter. Um, you know, the plain areas are fine, but the other areas around it, um, it's quite incredible how wet we're getting in the winter. And then normally get to the middle of March, it don't rain until right. November. So you get it all in one go. The climate, everyone goes on about climate change now, but definitely something to it because you just don't get that weather that you used to get. It's like, it's weird with the open. It was not really windy for the four days yet. Since then, it's blooming blowing a gale every single day. And I'm like, why couldn't we get one day like that? That would have sorted them out that one of them days. That would have sorted out the golf scores, that's for sure. Maybe yeah. uh, would have changed things. Morikawa and, uh, you know, getting that win was was amazing. But, you know, you, you introduce him to, you know, one of his first opens and having the wind howl might have changed things dramatically. Um, you know, it's interesting here in San Diego, we don't get any rain either from April 1st to about December 1st, usually. And I would agree with you that the patterns have changed. It, but I've been growing grass since the early 1980s, and I do remember um, – having some strange Augusts and these cycles that come and go. Uh, but there is something definitely, uh, you know, different about some of the weather patterns that are going on right now. And so, you know, having that rain, I mean, we just grip and grind to get rain. And this year, this year we only had four inches of rain for the entire rainy season. Uh, is, and what kind of rain do you guys get down there during a regular, a regular year? Uh, 800 mil, 700 mil. Okay. So, so not yeah. very much. It's, yeah, we, we've had up to 900, but the weird thing is, it's not the amount. You always end up with the same amount in the end. So it's, <laughs> one lad said to me, we always get the same amount every year, but we just right. get it all in the winter now, and we don't get any in the summer. But I can't complain, because we in we had five mil of rain in April this year, and I thought, oh, here we go, going to be a stressful year. But then we had like 80, 88 mil in May, another 60 mil in June. We never get that. So no. it, it really helped. This would normally, everyone was like, it's quite surprised to see the course quite green. Um, and I think for the whole area where I am in the southeast, most golf courses, I play golf uh, nearby course, Seen Valley. And it's been the greenest I've ever seen it. Normally it's brown in June and July. Uh, so we were all unusually quite green compared to how we normally are. But I felt it, I actually felt it helped the look of it. And I felt, uh, we got the fairways right, the rough, all right, it's brutal, but the first and second cut were fine. They yeah. actually all helped. It just sort of helped for this year. Right. Well, you know, one of my previous shows, we'd talked about uh, some of the courses, and I, I've played um, – I played the new course at St. Andrews. I didn't get a chance to play the old course. And, you know, from the tee, the rough looks very penal. Um, but those fescue grasses are actually quite wispy and you can advance the ball. But I noticed uh, in your rough outside your, you know, the that inter intermediate and primary cut outside of that was very, very lush and, and, and penalizing this year, which I, which I thought was very refreshing. You didn't have to hit it into the gorse of the heather uh, to really get punished. And so it really brought out the accurate driver of the golf ball. And so that, that was one of the other things. It was such a, a fabulous frame where before it has a tendency to, kind of wisp out there in the British Isles a little bit. We, to be fair, uh, normally it would be a lot more wispy. So we've yeah. had two wet years, uh, two wet winters, and we'd have dried out last summer. And then, so we'd have had a wet winter this year. But going into spring, like like I said, May and June, it's suddenly pulled down. But what affected everything was not having the opening 20. So we do a lot of cut and collect, as you know, and I thin out the rough. And uh, in the past, I might have sprayed it or sanded it. So we've left it for two years. And then, of course, we've had two heavy winters and a wet spring. So it's not, it's never, the members hate that rough. They're all moaning yeah. now, as yeah. you can imagine. When are you going to cut the rough down? They're all mad at you. Wait, yeah. I can't wait to cut it down and we'll do it because we're not allowed to cut it down until November. So from November to March, we'll cut it down. And then, if you think uh, burning the insides of uh, bunkers is interesting, wait until I start setting fire to the rest of the rough on the course. <laughs> that, that gets quite interesting. Uh, 
<laughs> you can't do that here in the States. You used to be able to burn the rough or, or uh, used to be able to burn the grasses at the, the yeah. seed fields up in Oregon, you know, where all of our ryegrass seed comes from. You used to be able to burn the fields to get ready for your new crop and you're not allowed to burn anymore. And so the environmental impact has been pretty heavy, but good for you. You still get to burn that rough. You don't have to use a herbicide. I think it's much more natural and it's the way it should be. And, you know, waiting for your members to react to the post open conditions for me is just so exciting. We had a 2006 uh, junior amateur at Rancho Santa Fe when I was there and we had the Ricky Fowlers and, and those kids playing in that, in that year. And I had the rough up so dramatically high and it took us three months to get it down the same thing you're dealing with and my, my members were out there you know fishing for golf balls uh, and the rounds were taking five hours but that's the nature of the beast when you have a, a championship at your golf course and so uh, if, if they agree to it they've got to deal with the aftermath as well yeah um don't get me wrong you got the lower handicappers quite happy uh, you got to yes. leave rough and then you see everyone just looking in the same old rough area and you feel a bit sorry for them and uh, i want it I actually want it long and wispy. And the thing is, it's not just, there are courses out there that just have pure fescue in a rough. We, right. we don't. So I've got crested dog's tail, sweet vernal. Uh, there's different types of fescue out there. So it's, it will look nice, but you, it deceives you and you think you can get a decent club to it and it wraps around the hosel and <laughs> yeah. a little bit. But at least you don't lose your ball and you can find it if you know roughly where you hit it. Right. I want that's the look I want. I actually personally for me I felt it's too thick, but bearing in mind that the weather was quite nice, no wind, it was actually about right. So for these guys, you know what, it was seven fifty yards it was in width from second cut to second cut. So mm. you know what? They're quite wide in this modern yes. era. So if you're in the rough, you deserve to be punished for a major, really. Right. Well, you know, it's, it's a field of play that changes, you know, and, and the golfer really has to understand that when he comes out, there's all kinds of factors that are uh, going to affect uh, the way that the game is played. And that's the most beautiful thing about golf. I mean, it's not like a, a, a football pitch or a, you know, a rugby pitch, you know, and I'm just using the, the UK vernacular over here, we would call it a rugby field or a football field, but over there, I think that you call it a pitch and, and it's, it's fairly predictable unless it rains uh, you're going to have the same height to cut and everything else and yeah, but but golf is different and in trying to get that player to understand maybe you shouldn't hit driver here you know it's firm and fast maybe you ought to hit a rescue or maybe even a long iron you know why are you hitting driver sideways into the secondary rough and now you've got problems and get, it's a thinking person's game it's strategic to the, the height of a, a person's intellect to be able to understand how to get through those 18 holes of golf. And that's the beauty of the game. And it, it's really, I think, our job to let the golfer know that it's their responsibility to understand there's a score you're going to take today, and it's up to you to try to determine how to get to where that is. So um, I, I want to move on to kind of our, our last topic, and, and that is, is this... Is Royal St. George's um, where you're going to end up? Is it your dream job? Is it is it a place that you could retire at? And if I if you don't mind me asking, how old are you, Paul? Uh, that's a good question. I always <laughs> lie, so I'm going to say fifty, but I might have my fiftieth in January because I've lied so much. I've confused myself with what age I am. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, so yeah, well, when you come to San Diego, Paul, we'll celebrate your 50th. Okay. Yeah. yeah we'll just we'll do that. Let's yeah. hope we can fly and travel. Cause we'll do that. Yeah. That, that's sure. a really good idea, Matt. I like that. So, you know, f for me, I, I think I, I always had this idea of a dream job and I think I ended up at my dream job for such a, a long career at the same place. And, you know, it educated my children and it had paid off my house and all those things just gave me such wonderful memories with so many uh, great members and staff that I had. Um, but, you know, you still have aspirations maybe of, of doing a major championship. And now that you've got one of those, um, is it, is it something that you want to continue to do? And, you know, I'm sure some of your members may end up seeing this. I don't want to put you on the spot, but you know, we, we all have uh, dreams of this, this crazy industry we call golf. Um, is it, and you've got an 11 year old boy that probably just adores uh, being out there with you. I, I would think that's a place you could probably stay until you retire. Right. Oh, 
Uh, definitely. Um, I mean, it's a very good question. And uh, when you say dream job, uh, now I played, I lived as well in Folkestone, which is half an hour away from here. And I play a little course, a little private members course where I'm actually chairman of Greens of that course as well. So it's quite Man. unique seeing it from both sides now. It's, uh, sure. It actually increases my knowledge on how we should do our job and everything. But the dream job probably was St. George's here. This is the best. This is the course in this area. We've yes. got some great courses and we've got Princes and St. Paul's nearby, North Orleans and Ryan, Canterbury. There's some great courses around here as well. Um, I never I never envisaged coming to work here. It sort of just happens. And I was an assistant here for two years. And then I left to go to Holland for four years where I was managing a course out there. So my plan, I never really... It's weird. I don't have a plan, like a, a game plan. I'm going to do this by this age, this by this age and all that. It just sort of happens. I just believe it, sure. it's sort of fate how it works out. It is important. I'm, I'm no longer with my lad's mum anymore. So I've got to stay local to a point. I see him from school. And he's obsessed with football. and yeah. he, loves a bit, he loves a bit of golf and he's into the cure and a bit of the 80s and 90s. So <laughs> I don't know where that came from. <laughs> all I can say is as an 11 year old kid to get him that way, I couldn't mold him any different. I, oh my God. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Well, I just hope it's not one of them when I get to 16, you go, Oh, where did it all go wrong? So, uh, yeah, I hope it turns out well, I think, but, I yeah, think he's going to be fine. I think he'll be yeah, fine. I think so. I think uh, he'll and be he, fine. he, he, he adored the open and everything. He, he loves here and the guy, everyone looks after him here. So it's, it's brilliant. So yeah. I don't, it's weird because I've got a new, I, I want to make the course better if I stay for next year or for the future. There's a few things I've got up my sleeve that I want to do because I feel like I need to get more fescue in the greens. I want to thin the rough out a little bit. Uh, there's a couple of projects I've got to do. I'm not, I don't think I can go to a golf course and just sort of just cut the grass and go through the motions. Yeah. I, uh, I have to, you have to strive for a 10 out of 10, so to speak. And sometimes you have to break a few eggs to get there. You sure do. And and that's, we may have to do that a bit more now. As everyone who knows me, I've certainly, uh, it's not been an easy journey with what I've done here. Uh, we had lots of ryegrass, Yorkshire fog, power in the greens, fairways weren't very good. You said to me earlier about the open course, is this the best condition course you'd seen? Well, that's very, that, I take that as a massive compliment because I'm friends with all the guys on all the other open courses. And Carnoustie is my favourite. And Craig, he does a brilliant job out there. And I look out there, I think, wow, uh, I've got to be as good as them. And I remember going to Hoy Lake years ago and their fairways were miles better than ours when I first went there. And I thought, crikey, we've got to up our game a bit. And then mm -hmm. Port Rush, I went to Port Rush, yep. one of the best courses ever. How, oh, just fantastic. When Shane Lowry like, run, uh, Shane Lowry yeah, run. Shane like, Lowry won. It, and it was, I was, it actually, was great. It was, the course was brilliant. And it was. I was actually nervous of uh, following that. Maybe being postponed a year was probably quite good because I thought, oh, what a, what a setting that was and everything. But as it worked out, we've all got our unique, charm to each course and from all the guys that i talked to we always want to get it a bit better we're our own biggest critics and yeah we'll have members moaning and sometimes you know we all make mistakes and i remember talking in front of a load of fed green keepers once and i went down a road of killing the greens uh in 2013 or 14 uh if i look back on what i did it was the right thing to do at the time but if I went back to do it now, I would do it differently. Change some things, yeah. I would change some things, but it was the right thing at that time. So you can't have regrets. It was definitely the right thing, but you learn more as you do it. Uh, and now I'll give advice to anyone. And you know what? It's actually not for everyone. So I always look at you say, if you're a mentor, I don't think many people, not being big headed in any way, with all the... Uh, strife that we've been through here because i've had a bit of grief in the past with what we've been through 
Sure. Uh, it takes a certain character to get through that. And I still believe Green Keepers, it becomes your life, doesn't it? But it's still a job to me. Uh, but it's everything you do. But if you sack me or you want someone else, that's fine. I've done the best I can. Yeah. If I can have a job. Now, I've gone around traveling the world. That was the greatest experience I've done because if it didn't work, it didn't eat. Now, I've built roller coasters. I was scared of heights. I've walked the loop. I've sold sweets to charity companies. I've yeah. picked kiwi fruit. <laughs> You've met fruit. other Paul Larsons? I mean, in Vegas? Like... Yeah. <laughs> I know. I should have gone You're to pretty Vegas. accomplished. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, I'm, I'm secretly uh, a lawyer in disguise. But, yeah. Um, but, there's well, you, you know it, it you know actually, i i think yep i think um the, the guys that that do what we do um you, you get so creative um you get good at so many different things that you know when when you do finally leave the business or you decide to stay you're you're convinced you can do anything you can manage anything you can control uh, you know your your own to a certain extent uh, your own end game and because we've gotten so good, I think, um, at managing all these different factions and, and weather and staff and, and just so many management things, and you just you get excellent at a lot of different things. And so it's obvious with you um, and, and the product that you put out um, and the, the path that you've traveled, I'm just, just really, really impressed with, uh, with uh, Paul Larson. I mean, the real Paul Larson, I think we're really, really impressed with the real Paul Larson here. And so, well, we're going to uh, kind of end this. I think we're, we're 35 minutes in and we don't want to uh, get this, this episode too long, but uh, if, if you could um, send a message to, to everyone in the golf, in the golf game, people, every golfer in the world, this is, I'm kind of putting you on the spot here. If you could send a message by text, uh, to every golfer in the world, um, any idea what, what you'd like to tell them, what you'd like to, to get across to them after, you know, all your years of struggles and success uh, in golf? Can you think of anything? I don't want to put you on the spot. Yeah, without a, a small little catchphrase, where I play golf, the easiest thing to sum it up is I'm, I play a little golf course and I go there because I love the golf course. I love the people there. It's my social life as well. As much as everything's here at George's, I've got a secondary life over there as well. And you know what? I would still join every year, even if it was mud, and I'd still part on them. And I'd still have a good time in the bar afterwards. I'd still come in and moan the green should be bare. And I'd probably still moan that I landed in a couple of divots and all that. But all with everything going on in the world and everything, golf is meant to be fun. So enjoy it. Don't be overly critical of little things. We, we know we've got to strive to do everything perfect and we try, but go there and actually enjoy playing golf. And 90% of golfers love playing golf. We get old, it's the only sport in the world you can play at any age, at any ability. It's not like football. I try and no. play now and I've got to walk now. Uh, we've got to enjoy it as much and try not to... <laughs> I think in life with everyone, we can be too negative and we've got to look at the positives and we're all doing our best. And you know what? All I say is like youngsters coming into the game, we've got to give them a bit of leeway. It's quite hard working every morning early, all sorts of weathers, every weekend, bank holidays. Do you know what? Some days you ain't feeling it. Uh, <laughs> you might have had a bad day. But generally, we keep coming back because we love the golf course. And it hurts us to hear criticism. Oh. It's so enjoyable. For me, the Open, when people say, did you enjoy the Open, is the question they ask me. Such a, I can't say yes as such, because I, you, you sort of say yes when it's over. It's pure relief that all I wanted was everyone watching it to say they've enjoyed it, and all the players, more importantly as well, to say that they loved the golf course. And do you know what George has said? Sort of reputation pile. They hate the blind shots and the bad bounce. Or we didn't get hardly any of that. And I no, felt like the new Americans coming into it. When I've seen Americans come and play in the last few years before lockdown, they were uh, blown away by the landscape of the course and everything else. And my job, I felt, was to highlight everything we had to offer. 
and we just hope everyone i've always been saying i want everyone to come and see it in the flesh so they can enjoy it and you know what when the sun's blow out and a little bit of breeze and see the sea and all the fescue blowing in the winds and that oh it's yeah to behold. Oh. Uh, so that's what we've got to do we all love golf that's why we do it and that's why we play yeah. and that's why we work here that's, that's a, a long message that is yeah. a very long message. That's that's three or four texts, but yeah. <laughs> but you nailed it. Just try to enjoy yourself. You nailed Have fun. it. You got it right. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. well, well, Paul. Cheers to you. God bless you. I, I you're just a breath a breath of fresh air and just such a, a revelation to me. And I'm so glad that you responded to me on LinkedIn. Thank God for LinkedIn that I was able to reach out to you, and bring you on the show. Um, Please don't hesitate to look me up when you come to San Diego. Oh, we've yeah, got, sure. We've got three extra bedrooms. You're welcome to stay at the house. And uh, we can just talk golf all day long because uh, it excites me. And then we'll take you to my little golf course that I play called Goat Hill uh, in you Oceanside. And yeah. you would love it. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with John Ashworth and uh, the Link Soul Clothing Company. Uh, but that's his, that's his place. And uh, maybe look it up on the internet. And it's a shot maker's paradise and a great group of people. And so... Um, we're going to sign off. Thank you so much. And, uh, we'll, we'll talk soon. And thank you very much for coming on fresh cut. Yeah. Oh, I would be remiss if I didn't mention our title sponsor, which is Bosch power tools, yes. uh, go down and pick your, pick yourself up something at home Depot or Lowe's. Uh, it's the best stuff in the world. So Bosch power yeah. tools. Thanks again, Paul, thank for coming in. Thank you so much, in. Paul. And Paul, I'm going to find you on LinkedIn and Facebook. So when you come yeah, out to San thanks. Diego, we're celebrating 50 years, buddy. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, thanks for having me. And uh, you know what? I just, I'm just me. I'm not anything special. We oh. just couldn't keep us. Well, to do. when I request you on Facebook, I hope it's you and not the lawyer in Vegas. So I'll <laughs> we'll, both, we'll both friend you. So uh, <laughs> you get the both, best of both worlds. All right. That's awesome. Okay. All right. Paul, thanks thanks again, sir. Thank you for Thank taking you, time Paul. out. Take care. Bye. -bye. Thanks for listening to Fresh Cut. Tune in next week for another amazing guest and make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And if you're playing the great game of golf today, fill in those divots and stay on the card paths.